you are looking for generating as much as 2.885 billion in EBITDA uh, by 2026. So within the next five years, what gives you the confidence, Peter, that you can ramp up production uh, and sales, obviously, to the point where you're going to be able to deliver on that kind of a target? Well, I think we've got an ambitious but yet real, realizable plan. Um, we've shown that we can execute. Uh, if you look at the factory that we've built to date, we did that in record time, the first greenfield purpose-built uh, EV factory in North America. So the team I've got and surrounded myself with are consummate professionals, and we've got the expertise, we've got the track record of delivery. The Security and Exchange Commission defines a penny stock as a stock that trades below $5 a share. Lucid is not just an absolute financial disaster, it's on the brink of penny stock status. I'm sure for their investors, it's felt like a long journey from the good old days of 2021, where Lucid was trading as high as $57 a share. But actually, it hasn't been that long, just over two years. As of today in October of 2023, you can buy a share for $5.16, which means Lucid stock has dropped 91% from November of 2021. Analysts of the company attribute the precipitous fall of the share price to various reasons throughout its short life, be it production woes, cash burn, or lack of demand. But maybe it all started because of Tesla. The company was initially named Ativa and was founded in 2007. The founders, including former Tesla board member and vice president Bernard Zay, envisioned a company that would create electric vehicle batteries and motors to be sold to auto manufacturers. The company would eventually be renamed to the one we know now, Lucid Motors, in 2016, after they decided it sounded too much like a yogurt brand. Their vision of being a supplier soon morphed into one where they would make a luxurious electric, high-performance car from scratch, and they saw no better man to lead the effort than another former Tesla employee, Peter Rawlinson, who oversaw vehicle or structural engineering, and was probably chief engineer of one of those teams. I say probably because of an infamous Elon Musk tweet that threw some doubt on what position Rawlinson held. Elon tweeted, Rawlinson was never chief engineer. He arrived after a Model S prototype was made, left before things got tough, and was only ever responsible for body engineering, not powertrain, battery, software, production, or design. Well, I know you don't like to talk about the competition, but he has taken some swipes at you on Twitter. He even said you were not the chief engineer mm -hmm. of Model S. What do you say to that? I wish I had that. I actually upstairs, I've got uh, some of my old business cards. I'll, it says chief engineer. I'll, I'll hand you the card. Regardless of the veracity of the tweet, the Tesla pedigree in this company set in motion a series of choices that would ultimately seal the fate of this EV startup as an unmitigated catastrophe. The first choice being the type of car they would make. What were you trying to accomplish with Tesla with the Model S? What was the sort of big goal there? Well, the goal was to prove the viability of an electric car in the luxury sector and really show the, the benefits of going electric to prove that it wasn't just possible. But actually, so you take those learnings and then you create this, this lucid. What am I seeing here? This, this is a beautiful car. Well, this is the next generation electric car. This is taking electrification to a whole no new level and rewriting the rule book. CEO Rawlson's career in the automotive industry started with Jaguar and Lotus, naturally as he was a Welsh engineer, and he would eventually bring his skills to Tesla in 2010. At that time, and as Elon stated earlier, the EV company was in the midst of creating the Model S. A four-door sedan considered luxury at the time due to the price and with performance characteristics of a high-end sports car. Rawlson's experience at his three former employers would infect his perspective on how to make a startup electric vehicle company successful, and he would try his hand at it when he was hired at Lucid. The concept would follow the path that Tesla was on now. To become profitable, you'll cater to the wealthy with a full-size luxury sedan with a hefty price tag. Rawlson would take Tesla's plan a step further with higher-end materials along with very unique styling and even more performance than his Tesla inspiration. All of these features, of course, further adding to the cost of the car, but the idea was to make something the rich would buy, and it should be exclusive to justify the price. The concept seems sound. You're essentially using the pocketbooks of the upper class to fund your EV startup and try not to lose too much per car as your company gets off the ground. This is exactly how Mercedes-Benz is one of the only companies not drowning in losses when they sell their EVs because they command high prices. The car is going to start at $100,000, is that correct? Well, we'll have a range of prices. The initial batch of cars that we sell will be highly specified, so therefore they'll average over 100,000, but we'll make progressively more affordable versions of the car available as we ramp up production because our car is operating in a different 
sector of the market. It's truly luxurious, luxurious car. So we're really, uh, you need to compare us with a Mercedes-Benz S-Class, not something like a C-Class Mercedes. Lucid would further complicate their plans to profitability by focusing on selling the most expensive of their Lucid Air trims at the beginning. When the ability to reserve cars went live in September of 2020, the three trims available were the $169,000 Air Dream Edition, the $139,000 Air Grand Touring, and the $95,000 Air Touring, though the cheapest of the three wouldn't be delivered until the end of 2022, over two years later. So that meant initial deliveries of Lucid's were the sky-high versions which began being shipped to customers in October of 2021. Do you know what is also sky-high in October of 2021? Inflation. Rawlson's choice to focus on these incredibly expensive EVs would coincide with the highest inflation the country has seen in generations. Many at the time weren't necessarily worried as it was considered transitory in nature, but it wouldn't be but five months later when the Federal Reserve's Jerome Powell recognized it for what it was, entrenched inflation affecting not just America, but the world, he would combat this cost pressure by beginning the fastest rate hike cycle the country has ever seen. What was a 0% federal funds rate when the Lucid Air was released quickly became over 5% in a year and a half. The times of cheap money was over. That low rate regime was what helped Tesla become the success it is today, but unfortunately, Rawlson's Lucid wouldn't be a beneficiary of it anymore. It wouldn't be long for Rawlson to see his plan was a mistake, but very little could be done to change the fate of his company. Rivian was able to carve out a market of its own by focusing on something Tesla wasn't doing, EV pickup trucks. GM and BYD were able to keep up volumes on their most affordable electric vehicles, which makes sense because of the reduced spending power of the consumer. As for Lucid, it would become a cash burning machine from the day it debuted on the NASDAQ. The macro environment never improved, and in reality, it's getting worse as time goes on. A startup company facing growing pains is to be expected, but the external factors would not be of any help. Supply chains were snarled by reopening of economies from the pandemic and Lucid was not immune, causing them to lower their forecast for production of 20,000 vehicles to just 12 to 14,000 in February of 2022, citing these supply chain constraints. That wouldn't be the last of adjustments to their estimates, though. In August of 2022, Lucid would have their production forecast to just 6,000 to 7,000 sedans, a third of what they originally guided for. Again, they blamed it on extraordinary supply chain and logistics challenges, with most of the blame specifically aimed at semiconductor shortages. Lucid getting hit this morning after the company reported results and slashing its production estimates. Want to get straight over to Phil LeBeau, who joins us with the latest. Phil, what's happening? Andrew, anytime you cut your production 30 to 40 percent, your production guidance, I should say, by 30 to 40 percent, your stock is going to get whacked. And that's what we saw yesterday after Lucid reported its Q4 results. Its new guidance for production for 2022, it was 20,000 vehicles. Now it's in the range of 12 to 14,000 vehicles. Why? The company is dealing with supply chain challenges. And we're not... Rawlson's engineering acumen wasn't high enough to overcome these so-called challenges, but interestingly, his competitors somehow made it through. Tesla production and deliveries grew 47% that year, and much of the growth could be attributed to the software and engineering teams being able to rewrite code to utilize fewer semiconductor chips throughout the car. So if Tesla was able to grow at a considerable rate in a high interest rate world, with logistics nightmares throughout every sector and outbreaks in China where it manufactures cars, you have to wonder if Lucid faced a demand issue. Rawlson would say that wasn't the case, hiding behind the tens of thousands of reservations that his company touted on earnings calls, but they no longer report reservations for some reason. What he couldn't hide was the company's financials. The repercussions of following Tesla's path to success would cripple the company by robbing it of its cash reserves. Having already found a reason to raise cash the same year it became public, which was a $1.75 billion senior note offering in December of 2021, Rawlson assured investors in early 2022 that they had the funds to take them well into 2023. They almost made it, but alas, they found the need to raise cash in November, this time for $1.5 billion, mostly from the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia, which is the majority owner of the company, and the remaining amount being a public stock offering diluting their shareholders. That wouldn't be the last of their capital raises, because in May of 2023, Rawlson's company would look to the public markets and the Saudi's PIF for more money, this time $3 billion in total. So you might ask, what is going on here? It's only been two years since they went public, which netted them $4.5 billion. And since then, they have raised over six billion more. To put that in perspective, it would take five years of Tesla being public to have raised six billion dollars. In their IPO, it only brought in two hundred twenty-six million dollars. In those five years, Tesla was able to deliver over fifty thousand cars. Might you wonder how many Lucid has sold? Just seven thousand one hundred and seventy-nine cars since their inception, and they produced much more than that, having manufactured eleven thousand six hundred sixty-seven. 
Yikes. In an earnings call held in February 2023, Rawlson would say his complete focus is on driving sales. The market interpreted this as this factory is not running at capacity, meaning no efficiencies are being realized even if he did solve his supply chain problems by now, and that they're burning through cash. All of these capital raises are just proxies for free cash flow destruction. On average, Lucid's quarterly cash burn is over $800 million, and they seem to like to raise capital when their cash on hand is in the $3 billion range. At the end of quarter two of this year, they had $5.2 billion, so unless their spending habits and sales have changed for the better, investors should expect that Lucid will raise more cash at the start of 2024. Supporters of the company would say that backing ownership of Saudis means Lucid will have a blank check every time they need a bailout. Ironically, the Saudi ownership and capital raises might be part of the reason Lucid isn't doing so great. Recently, Lucid just opened their Jeddah City factory with the aim to manufacture 5,000 cars a year. Oh, let me rephrase, assemble 5,000 cars a year because oddly, it will be shipping Lucid air kits to their new factory for workers there to assemble, not make them. In the 5,000 vehicle annual capacity would be two thirds of the cars they have ever sold. But who am I to judge? What we can judge though, is the terms of the Saudi's investment in Lucid. The fund initially gave the car company $1 billion in 2018, years before going public, and since going public, has injected another $2.5 billion. With a total investment of $3.5 billion and making Lucid agree to conditions, they would invest a rumored $3.2 billion in the construction of the Saudi Arabian factory, it doesn't seem like all that great of a deal. Lucid's future from here on out is looking ever more cloudy, because unlike Tesla's early years, Rawlson's company is facing competition from every angle. The legacy OEMs, Chinese brands, and their fellow EV startups. But if Lucid's investors are counting on Saudi Arabia to continually bail them out, I suggest they watch out for the Saudi and Foxconn EV joint venture and ask themselves a few questions. Is it Lucid or Apple's manufacturing partner that has a better grasp on production at scale, supply chains, technology, software, autonomy, and infotainment? Because if you ask Foxconn's chairman, Young Liu, he would tell you their collaboration will make electric vehicles mainstream in Saudi Arabia and beyond.